Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome all those who are here and those who are online to our uh, lecture on uh, decarbonisation of uh, of uh, iron for DRI uh, with Richard Brearley. Just a quick announcement before we do start. Our next meeting in January uh, is from Circular Fuels, a company who are developing uh, new fuels by recycling plastic. Uh, I have circulated the uh, poster. Uh, there are still a few places left as well on the visit to the A1 Locomotive Trust for any railway enthusiasts. So uh, without further ado, I shall uh, try and share my screen and try and find the right. Right, so there we are. Uh, to screen show. Right, so I shall hand over to Richard Brearley. I'll let you say a bit about yourself before you start. Uh, if you sort of stand about here, the camera will just get you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone in the room and good evening to everyone online. Uh, I'm Richard Burley, uh, I'm the Group Manager for Advanced Materials at the Materials Processing Institute. Uh, I have a fairly varied background. I uh, started off uh, as a military engineer, uh, electrical electronics, and worked my way through into civil engineering, power systems, uh, large scale distribution of power, and many other systems around the world. I've worked for a variety of companies, and the past couple of years, I joined the Materials Processing Institute in industrial decarbonization, and I've since moved across to advanced materials. So, tonight, I'm going to uh, give you a talk about decarbonizing hydrogen for DRI feed. That's it, that, that's it. We're, we're, sorry, there was a, another tab on the screen that I had to close. Okay, so the steel industry contributes between about 7 and 9% uh, of the world's CO2 emissions. Now, you're going to see lots of figures through this presentation that are slightly vague. And as many of you are probably aware, industry is a very large animal across the world. And as such, it's always difficult to pin down the exact figures. Once you start getting above a certain size, it's always difficult to start pinning down exact figures. However, one thing that we do know is we need to meet emissions target figures by 2050, as laid down in the Paris Agreement in 2015, and as we've seen in recent COP events as well, COP27 in the most recent. So efficiencies can be made across industry for their processes to reduce energy and carbon usage. However, energy efficiencies on their own will not be enough to achieve the 80% reduction in emissions targets that's required. Large amounts of fossil fuels are consumed to produce steel, so through the iron process and into steel. And if these could be replaced, then significant reductions in emissions could be achieved. An option then for replacement of fossil fuels is hydrogen. We've heard an awful lot about hydrogen recently. And I'll, I, when I come to the last line of this, I'll, I'll explain how I feel about hydrogen. An option then is for hydrogen. There are many routes for reduction of hydrogen, and we're going to look at some of those routes. And then we're going to look at the DRI process about hydrogen could be used in that. How the hydrogen revolution began? I wrote that line about four years ago. I'm still not convinced yet that we're there. Um, I like, like to liken hydrogen to a little bit like a wild grouse shoot, if you like. You don't know how many birds there are. There's loads of people beating to drive these grouse out to be shot. We don't know how many people are there to shoot them, and we don't know what to do with them when we shot them. That doesn't mean I'm dismissive of hydrogen. I actually like the idea of hydrogen. I just think we need to get it right. So predicted steel emissions constraints then. Now these figures are based on the 2015 when the Paris Agreement was uh, published. And we can see the figures, million tons of CO2 produced and where we should be by 2050. Then we can look at the global steel demand. And the reason why this is divided up is we have standard production in light blue, so blast furnace, BOS or BOF, depends on your preference. And then we have scrap, and into electric arc furnaces in the dark blue segment in the middle. Now, the reason why I say some of these figures are 
slightly slewed is because on the previous slide, I said an 80% reduction. That's compared to today's figures. But actually, if we compare them to the 2015 figures, as is in this slide, we actually need to achieve a 90% reduction compared to that data. So we're part of the way there already. We're doing some very, very good things. And we've made lots and lots of energy efficiencies. And this is why I say energy efficiencies on their own will not achieve these targets because we're already doing lots of really good work and we've only knocked a small percentage off so far. So some of the, uh, the CO2 figures then for industry. On the top column, we have blast furnace BOF or BOS, and we can see we produce approximately two tons of CO2 per ton of hot metal. If we then look at DRI and electric arc furnace, in the first instance, we say, yeah, let's go down the DRI EAF route because it's cleaner. If, however, you're using coal, as is still used in many countries around the world at the moment, we can see actually there's a significant increase in CO2 per ton of hot metal. However, once we go down the natural gas route, we can start seeing some of those figures are lowered down to 1.4 tons. And if we went down the scrap electric arc furnace, so if we could produce enough scrap steel that we could replace all of our steel that we currently need, then we could reduce that down to 0.4 tons of uh, per ton of metal. And the global average is 1.7 tons of CO2 per ton. Now, you may have seen figures such as 1.85, and you'd be completely right to pull me up on that, because actually the figure is 1.85. However, this is just the global average for the production of hot metal. This does not include the figures for post-production. So if you're making an I-beam or a T-beam, or you're going on to manufacture that into a car part, then that's where the extra 0.15 actually comes in on that figure. So energy demand per tonne of hot metal then. So we've seen the CO2 figures, now we can look at the energy demands. The interesting one is the green blocks at the front, the electric arc furnace, and we can see they are incredibly low compared to the basic oxygen furnace route. So that'd be blast furnace into basic oxygen furnace. And we have three figures there, minimum, what could we possibly achieve? What actually realistically could we achieve the practical minimum? And then the actual requirements, how much energy actually goes into those. But we can see that the electric arc furnace is significantly lower. Now, 29% apologies of global steel comes from electric arc furnaces. That equates to 1.17 exajoules per year for going down the electric arc furnace route. That includes scrap and DRI going into the electric arc furnace. So we can see that's not an insignificant amount of energy. That's quite a lot. In fact, that's approximately 25% of the global energy production. So hydrogen coming into Europe then. If we look at hydrogen coming into Europe, these are some of the figures that have been published and some of these have changed just recently. But we are looking across Europe to produce six gigawatts of electrolyzers, which will produce 1 million tons of hydrogen per year. Quite a nice figure. By 2030, we're hoping to have up to 10 million tons of renewable, that's the key point there, of renewable hydrogen. And then large scale deployment of renewable hydrogen across industry, industry is anticipated as we move forward past 2030. But we're no longer part of Europe anymore. I mean, we are, we're still geographically part of Europe, but the European economic community, we're not. So the UK, what are we looking for in the UK then? If I pull up the first key point here is heat neighborhood initial trials. 2023. This is actually on the go at the moment in Gateshead. Approximately 600 homes, two businesses, and a school are being tested on hydrogen. That they can do that there because it's a closed village. And so, therefore, it doesn't affect anything of the other infrastructure around it. So, by the mid 20s, we're heading rapidly into that. We're aiming for one gigawatt production capacity by 2025. And we're looking for a heat village trial by 2025. So scaling up from the, the 600 
houses and the two industries up to a larger scale. As we move forward then into late twenties, we're looking at five gigawatts. And again, this is another one of those figures that's now wrong. That's actually now 10 gigawatts. Last year, they changed that figure. However, these, these graphics haven't changed yet from the government, but the target is now 10 gigawatts. How, and how are we going to achieve that? So we're looking at two CCUS clusters by 2025 and four CCUS clusters by 2030. I'm always slightly skeptical about CCUS. I think it's a great idea because we need we need to employ everything. We can't just go down one route. We need to employ everything. But it also gives us the license to carry on just using fossil fuels as they are, which we're capturing. We capture it and bury it in the ground. But it's better than pumping it into the atmosphere. So production of hydrogen then for the steel industry. So global steel production is approximately 1.8 billion tonnes per year. That's on this year's figures. Uh, unlike 2015 figures where you saw it's 1.6. Steel produced through direct reduced iron and electric arc furnace route is 108 million tonnes. So you can see it's a small fraction of that through direct reduced iron. Now earlier I gave you the figure of 25%. But again, that includes scrap going for electric arc furnace as well. So the emissions from the electric route of steel making then is already lower than that for the integrated route. And I showed you a figure of 0.4% from scrap. If we go for the DRI route, then it's about 0.6 rather than 0.4. However, that's compared to the 0.8 tons of CO2 per ton of hot metal from your standard conventional routes, blast furnace, BOS, and into post production. But the electric process still uses large quantities of fossil fuels, either directly or indirectly. So you've got your uh, class one or your class two um, emissions. So from direct source or from your power supply. Natural gas may be able to be substituted with hydrogen as a reductant. And that's where we're looking at this for direct reduced iron. I'm not covering every category here, just the direct reduced iron. So the production of hydrogen as a fuel from electro electricity may not be cost effective as heating could be provided direct from electricity. So if you stick an electrolyzer on site and use electricity, you've already got a percentage loss there. If your electrolyzer is say 80% efficient, and we'll come on to those figures as we go through. If it's 80% efficient, you've already lost 20% of your electricity. Then you're gonna lose one or 2% of your hydrogen as well whilst you're in production and where you're transferring it around. So you've get, again got a significant loss. However, there are certain processes within iron and steel where the chemical reactivity of gas is actually required. And that direct heat can be more advantageous than electricity. So you have to weigh up your process and decide which one is more advantageous for you. So some methods of hydrogen production then. We have uh, if you like the old fashioned method, methane steam reforming. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people are probably familiar with that, uh, but we'll come into how that works anyway. And that's steam reforming of natural gas and methane. You could also do coal, although it's far less common. Uh, autothermal reforming. This is an advanced method of steam reforming. And again, we'll, we'll drop into that one. Gasification of coal and biomass, pyrolysis, and then electrolysis, which is the current green method. Just trying to mute everybody else. Apologies, one moment, and I'll be back with you. Mm. Sorry about this. Can't find it, so. Just a go, I'll just talk louder. Uh, one moment. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully you've all had a time to go for a drink now, so we'll carry on.
So finally, electrolysis is, is the new uh, green method, shall we say. Uh, you have conventional electricity and then renewable power. If you go from conventional electricity, then you still have your, uh, your power being produced from fossil fuels. Steam reforming then, what is steam reforming? There's a lot of text on here, but we'll, we'll cut to the important points. So traditional steam reforming, reforming, as I mentioned before, comes from fossil fuels. And the first process of that, we're producing thin gas, so carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And we see from that first reaction, we produce some hydrogen. If we then blend some more with water, we can then go on and produce some more hydrogen. So we get quite a lot of hydrogen out of this process. However, it is endothermic, so it does take energy, heat energy, going into this to actually create the hydrogen. The carbon monoxide output doesn't just go to waste. We can then take that and we can put that through the water gas shift reactor. And if we do that from the next stage down, we get some more hydrogen out. So our carbon monoxide hasn't gone to waste. We've combined it now with some water and we've got more hydrogen. Where this becomes really interesting, you have to put a certain amount of energy into this in the first place. However, it then becomes exothermic. So you can take about 41 kilojoules per mole energy out. You can feed that back into your traditional steam reforming part. And so you're recirculating some of that energy. So you're actually saving some of the energy from that process because it takes heat under the, over the first process. Now, at the moment, we've just highlighted methane there, CH4. However, we could go for the biomass route. And if we process some biomass, then we could actually follow this same route through as well of steam reforming. Autothermal reforming then, it's steam reforming, but it's a little bit souped up, it's a little bit extra added. And what we do is we combine this with oxygen now. So within our reaction, we have a very similar reaction as we had before in steam reforming, but we're producing some hydrogen, again, some syngas, some water, and some carbon monoxide. And then we take that a step further, and then we can process that even more with some more water and some more oxygen, and we can go on to create extra hydrogen. And again, the carbon monoxide can then be recycled around into the water shift gas reaction. Apologies online, we can, there's some people frantically scribbling down in the audience, so. Uh, okay, so gasification now. This one's really quite interesting. We can go for gasific uh, gasification of biomass, domestic, agricultural and commercial food waste, and fossil fuels again. So we have to be careful which route we go down here, because we end up, if we end up using fossil fuels, then we end up producing, again, that that problem of CO2. However, we again can produce syngas, much the same as we did from autothermal reforming and steam reforming. There's the added advantage, you have tars, charcoal, chars, heat and lignin come from this. And in fact, this was a process that um, Germany used during the Second World War for producing fuels from coal. And they were very successful at it. So this isn't new technology. It's just what the feedstock is might be new. How does it work then? How does, if we take biomass as our feedstock, so we take our feedstock, we subject it to a little bit of heat, drying, 100 to 150 degrees, and we drive off water vapor. At the bottom is the products that are coming up these stages. We can then go into pyrolysis, where we heat between 200 and 500 degrees C. That's heating without air. Now this reduces your volatiles and produces biochar. So again, you have a secondary product coming out here. Again, this is an endothermic reaction. So again, you require heat being put into this. The next stage then is oxidation. So we can add oxygen either from air or direct oxygen feed into it. Again, this requires some heat being put in because we're driving this to 800 to 500 degrees C. However, once we get to that, the actual output process is exothermic. So we can take some of that heat and reuse it in lower grade uh, heat requirements, such as the drying or the pyrolysis phases. And then there's a reduction phase. So we can convert the remaining product 
into producer gas. And again, this is an endothermic reaction, so we drop that temperature back down. But again, in the boxes across the bottom, you can see that there's a significant amount of hydrogen actually being produced here. So these are some really interesting methods that could be used. And this isn't new technology. In fact, we were having a discussion before this tonight saying lots of the technology for decarbonisation or for moving forward actually already exists. We just need to actually get on and do it. So now we'll come on to what's classified as the green processes. Hydrogen water electrolysis. So we have hydrogen and oxygen in water. Not quite in those ratios, it's H2O rather than H2 and O2, but when they form as gases, those are what you get out as a product. Some of the key points about this is what electricity do we actually use then in these processes? Again, if we go down the fossil fuel route, then we've still got the problem of we're using fossil fuels. Uh, could we go down the hydroelectricity route? Yes, we could do that. Wind, solar are also options. Hydroelectricity, however, in the countries where hydroelectricity is actually quite large as a power source, they use that as a base load. So using it to produce hydrogen might not necessarily be the best way forward. Something that we don't really often hear about, but I've just mentioned in the top paragraph there, is when we're producing hydrogen, we're also producing oxygen. So why don't we take that oxygen as well and use it? There's a huge industry out there for oxygen. We pay about 62 pounds for a nine cubic meter canister of it. Why don't we bottle it and capture it and use it and sell it? So I'm going to go through three different types of electrolysis. So we have solid oxide electrolysis. These produce hydrogen from water at the cathode and the oxygen goes through the diaphragm and passes out at the anode. These run on high pressure and high temperature systems at the moment. However, from laboratory scale, I've already got these down to 500 degrees C. So these are advanced in technologies and certainly for the future, these could well be a really important mechanism for hydrogen. And efficiencies rate between about 90 and 100 percent. So I mentioned earlier 80 percent. So these are already looking at 90 to 100 percent. However, you do need to add a lot of heat into this process. So they are energy intensive in the first instance. Next one, then, alkaline water electrolysis. This is probably the oldest form of electrolysis that we have. Uh, it's well-established technology. We can operate between about 30 and 80 degrees C. Uh, we already have these in the megawatt range. So this, this is well-established technology. Uh, you use different alkaline solutions. So you use potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. Uh, hydrogen, again, is produced from water at the cathode. And the OH molecules pass through the anode and are released then as uh, oxygen again. plus. Uh, radical electrons. These are around about 70 to 80 percent efficiency. And the final one we'll touch on is polymer electrolyte membrane, PEM. Now, this is fairly new technology on the electrolysis scale. It's fairly new technology. Uh, so, probably about the last 30 years or so. These have really good efficiencies, 80 to 90 percent consistently. However, one of the really big selling points for PEM is the purity, 99.99. Now, across industry, if we want to use hydrogen as a reactant, everyone's asking for 99.999 or 99.995. In the form of PEM, you would actually get that type of purity that you actually want for industry. And then water is separated out at the anode where O2 is released. And again, the hydrogen is then uh, the hydrogen passes through the diaphragm and is released at the cathode in this system. So an overview of those three systems then. So we have PEM, high efficiency, 80 to 90 percent, or overall, all fairly high. High purity, it's the highest purity of these three systems. However, it's new technology at the moment, low durability and high cost. However, we do give it a high purity range. Whereas the other systems, you would have to then put them through a cleaning process. So the alkaline water electrolysis, established technology, 
energy efficiency, 70 to 80 percent. Non-noble catalysts, so that's always good. We're not using noble elements for this. Uh, low current density and low purity of product. And the solid oxide electrolysis, uh, high efficiency, 90 to 100 percent. So it's the best for efficiency wise. Uh, again, non-noble catalysts at high operating pressures. But these are still only laboratory scale at the moment, and they have low durability. However, there's certainly high scope there for those to be used. And these could be installed on site at, an at well, at any industry site. But on the grounds that we're talking about DRI at a DRI site. So the, the crux of this sense, we, we know how we can produce hydrogen. How does this fit then into direct reduced iron? On the left, we have a basic process diagram. We have iron ore, fines, pellets, lump going into the top of our uh, shaft furnace. I've selected the shaft furnace for this, although there are different types. You have rotary furnaces. There, so there are a couple of methods for this, but we'll, we'll just work with a shaft furnace. Uh, ore preparation, so it has to be produced down to the right size before it goes into the furnace. Then you have the reduction process, and you can produce hot briquetted iron, so hot briquettes or um, all the pellets on the right hand side, or direct briquetted iron if you like, and that's a cold discharge. If it's hot, you want it on an integrated steel mill because it's highly reactive. So you either drench it in nitrogen or you take it straight into your process. The pellets can still be highly reactive because they have a high surface area, but they're quite often coated and again we can drench them in nitrogen. So we have gas preparation going in from the left hand side or coal preparation for your reducing agent. And what's important is what comes out the right hand side. Carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water vapour, NOx and the plus plus plus. I'll come on to that in a moment. On the right hand side now we have the shower furnace, but we use renewable energy to create hydrogen and the hydrogen goes in as a reductant. Through that reduction process, we produce water vapor, some excess hydrogen and the plus plus plus. The plus 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 is there because I don't know exactly what your ore is made of. Every ore is slightly different, depends on where it comes from in the world, has slightly different constituent parts. And so you're going to get a certain amount of volatiles given off. And so some emissions are going to come out there that will be more or less the same on both, both processes, depend on your ore. Now, the reaction pathways, this looks incredibly complex, and I'll break it down into small chunks. This is a reaction pathway in a DRI from Syngas. On the right hand side, we have the shaft axis, so we have half of a DRI system here. And we can see there are, there are lots of different zones. But what really interested in here is the hematite to magnetite conversion, the magnetite to versatite, and then the versatite to iron. And within the table in the middle, we can see that hydrogen from the hematite to magnetite accounts for about 11% of that reduction already using syngas. So we already know hydrogen works in a direct reduced iron furnace. We just need to jump it up to about 100%. The magnetite to versatite is approximately 18%. And then the versatile to iron is about 33% of that reduction. So that's a total of 62% of the reduction for the zinc gas, zinc gas actually comes from hydrogen already. So it's not a massive leap of the imagination to say, if we can just adjust the process slightly, we might be able to do it all with hydrogen. And a couple of points again on the end here. So indirect reduction of versatile down uh, with carbon monoxide is exothermic. So it gives off heat. However, the reduction with hydrogen is endothermic. So if you're using carbon monoxide, you have to control that temperature. If you're using hydrogen, then you might have to add a little bit of heat to the process. So these are extra considerations. So in some ways, we've covered an awful lot of information there. There's an awful lot to digest, but the slides will be made available so you can pick through these at your leisure. Hydrogen can be used as part of the energy mix, as a reductant and a reactant for significantly reducing the emissions from steel instruments, particularly as a reductant in the electric steel route, as shown in the DRI. There are many ways of producing hydrogen. 
We've covered some of those today, but not all of them by any stretch of the imagination. Steam reforming, autothermal, gasification, and electrolysis. And to produce hydrogen, we reduce carbon emissions. Some systems will need to deploy CCS if they are to continue using fossil fuels. Electrolysis can produce hydrogen with minimal carbon emissions if we're going from renewable and sustainable energy sources. There is no one solution to fit decarbonisation. It depends on your process, your procedures, and your age of your equipment and your investment, to be quite honest, because none of this is cheap. However, electrolysis may provide a viable option for the steel industry to become future compliant with the 2050 regulations. Thank you very much for your time.